We're on the shores of Lake Ontario in the town of Oswego, often thought of as the best place in the world to view a sunset. Hundreds of thousands of people, young and old, have looked out over the waters as the sun set on another day of summer fun at Camp Hollis. And no matter where life takes them after their stay here, they've never forgotten moments like this. Hi, I'm Jim Ferfaya, and I'm one of the lucky people who can say that Camp Hollis has had an incredible impact on my life. I often tell people that I fell in love with this camp before I was even born because my father came here when he was a kid and he remembered it as the best part of his childhood. Dad made sure that all of us kids went to camp and when it was my turn, I immediately felt like I was home. I spent five happy summers here as a camper and then worked my way through college as a counselor from 1974 to 78 and then worked as the summer director for two summers. I moved on to a teaching job in 1980 but as fate would have it, my time with Camp Hollis wasn't over yet. In 1990, I returned to my second home through a job with the Oswego City County Youth Bureau, which is in charge of Camp Hollis. For 21 summers, I planned the summer camp, which gave me the chance to work with some of the best people dedicated to youth recreation. I retired from that job in 2011, but I still volunteer at Hollis, tending its gardens working with the friends at Camp Hollis, and compiling memories from others who worked here. Through a collaboration with former and current staff, we offer you this video to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Hollis's founding in 1946. But to tell the complete story of this camp, we need to reach back a little farther in its history. In 1927, the Oswego County Committee on Tuberculosis and Public Health was looking for a permanent spot for their children's health camp. Tuberculosis was a dreaded disease with no known cure, and the committee had been sending people of all ages at risk of contracting the disease to institutions called sanatoriums, where they were isolated from the others. The isolation was helping to restore health, but the committee wanted a place for children where they could be served good food, practice healthy habits, and get plenty of fresh air, but also be able to have fun. The committee, headed by Dr. Leroy Hollis of Sandy Creek, had been operating a few weeks of summer camp at temporary locations and were looking for a place where they could call home. They found it on the shores of Lake Ontario. By 1928, children were enjoying six weeks of their summer at the Oswego County Health Camp. They came from all over the county and were handpicked by doctors, school nurses, and community helpers. My father was selected to be a camper because he was a skinny kid and sick a lot, and the health committee was targeting kids like him, hoping to build up their immune systems and give them a break from neighborhoods where TB had been detected. It seemed to help, but as the treatment and prevention of TB became more sophisticated, the need for a health camp lost favor. It closed in 1943. Three years later, Judge Eugene F. Sullivan was the county's children's court judge, and he saw a lot of kids who'd had a bad break in life, tough situations at home, brushes with the law, growing up in an orphanage, Sullivan believed that those children weren't bad kids. They were boys and girls who needed something positive in their life. He founded his new camp on that premise. In July of 1946, as the first children were enjoying their new camp, Dr. Hollis passed away and the camp was named in his honor. Quickly, it became a popular destination for kids each summer. One of the things that made Judge Sullivan's camp stand out from other camps was that from 1946 until 2003, there was never any cost for families to send their children here. The judge insisted that his camp be free of charge, thus removing the financial barrier and making it accessible to all Oswego County families. For decades, many children had a summer camp experience because of Judge Sullivan's no-fee policy. 
Even after 2003, when charges to attend the camp were initiated, the Friends of Camp Hollis, a not-for-profit support group for the camp, began providing financial assistance to families who could not afford the fees. This means that in 75 years, no child has ever been denied their chance to attend Camp Hollis because of financial constraints. The original road that brought those children to the camp followed the lakeshore and crossed the stream on a rickety bridge. Cars brought in campers, staff, and food supplies over the bridge until it gave out. But this was the site that the children had when they arrived at camp, the camp's only building overlooking the beautiful lakeshore. Nowadays, this is the first site children have of Camp Hollis. The tree-lined roadway helps set the scene for the camper's visit to a nature-oriented environment. For many years, children arrived at the camp on a school bus, each one stepping onto the campgrounds with a suitcase, or for those less fortunate, a paper bag with a change of clothes. No matter the year of Camp Hollis's history, more than a few children come to camp with butterflies in their stomach and maybe a touch of homesickness. That doesn't usually last long once the fun begins. Once arrived at the camp, children are escorted by a counselor to their sleeping quarters. During the health camp years and in the early years of Camp Hollis, campers slept in one of two large dormitories in the main building. Today, children sleep in these smaller family-style cabins. The first three were built in 1975. They were ready-made kits purchased from Sears catalog. Other cabins were built in 1977, 80, and 94. But wherever campers laid their heads at the end of the day, they shared that room with their bunkmates and their lead counselors. It's where kids from all walks of life learn to live together in community. Before heading out for some Camp Hollis fun with their new friends, campers have one more important stop. Before activities take place, children are checked in by the camp nurse. In the early days of the camp, when concerns of tuberculosis and other health risks were high, nurses performed a complete physical, taking special note of the camper's height and weight. The goal was to provide plenty of nutritious food while they were at camp, and to keep track of that progress, campers' weight and height were recorded at the beginning and the end of their stay. Awards were given out for those who had gained the biggest number of pounds. Activities always begin by meeting at the camp's flagpole, where the American flag and the Oswego County flag fly. The county flag is a visual reminder that the camp has always been overseen and supported by Oswego County, whose elected legislators vote year after year to keep the camp running. It's rare for a camp to be owned by a county government. Most camps are affiliated with 4-H, YMCA, Scouts, or a local church but Hollis has always had the county to support its mission and the camp's nearly 100 year history that has never wavered. While county officials and camp staff have always made sure that the children served at Camp Hollis are well fed and safe, kids are focused on having fun. Here on the playground, kids spend hours enjoying the equipment. Hi. I'm Alex Bush, and I worked at Camp Hollis from 2014 to 2018. And while I was here, I heard lots of stories about the activities that counselors came up with. Campers have always played sports, but I was surprised to learn that Camp Hollis once had its own baseball team right, that competed with teams from the city of Oswego. This started in the 1940s, when programs like Little League were becoming popular throughout the United States. Camp had a couple counselors who were excited to be baseball coaches, but they had a couple obstacles to overcome in order to have a little league team. Most importantly, they needed a regulation size baseball field, so counselors worked overtime to clear trees and smooth out the playing field. Soon, baseball was part of Camp's daily routine. The second challenge Hollis's baseball coaches faced was that their entire baseball team changed every two weeks right, when a new group of campers showed up to camp. But the coaches worked with what they had and soon Hollis had an official little league team 
sometimes known as the Camp Hollis Nine and other times the Camp Hollis Boys. The team made local newspapers sports headlines well into the 1960s. No camp experience would be complete without some arts and crafts. Over the years, talented counselors have taught kids how to weave God's eyes, paint rocks from the beach, and other creative activities. But by far, the most important activity involves some colorful plastic lanyard string. Hi, my name is Alexis Richer, and I've been on the Camp Hollow staff since 2018. I worked as an activity leader and a director. This special arts and crafts project with lanyard is called the Boondoggle. And while the crafts leader never has much of a budget for supplies, he or she always makes sure there's enough boondoggle string. Weaving boondoggle string for hours on end to make lanyards, friendship bracelets, or anything young minds can, be, can become an obsession. But one person took that obsession to new heights. One day, about 25 years ago, a rather long boondoggle appeared, draped over a wall-sized trail map in the main building. Nobody knows who put it there, nor who made it, but it remains there today, still catching the eye of passersby. Once they realize what they were seeing, people often stop for a closer look. Measuring 104 inches, this boondoggle is woven with an amazing eight strands that somehow worked 12 different colors into rounded, squared, and spiral shapes. It's a work of art and testimony to what can be achieved in a summer, some arts and craft supplies, and a patient counselor and camper. When people pull into the Camp Hollis parking lot, one of the first things they see is the Camp Hollis pool. Many people wonder why a camp located on Lake Ontario needs a pool. It's a good question. In fact, the first few decades of Camp Hollis did include children using the lake for their swimming pleasure. Former campers have great memories of enjoying a refreshing dip in the cool Ontario waters, with many earning their Red Cross swimming certificates while at camp. One long-standing Camp Hollis tradition that began back when campers were still swimming in the lake was called Polar Bear Swim. Polar Bear Swim takes place at the very beginning of each camp day. Before breakfast, any campers who are feeling brave can choose to slip out of bed and into their bathing suits for an early morning dip. Mornings at camp can be quite chilly, but they are never as cold as the water in Lake Ontario at sunrise. Jumping in the lake was a great wake-up call, sometimes even for the counselors. One staff member from the 1980s remembered walking his cabin of boys down to Lake Ontario. The campers would jump in and splash around, he said. It also helped me, a morning person, to wake up. By the late 1960s, health department officials deemed the lake too unpredictable for daily swims. This pool was built in 1972 to assure that campers could enjoy swimming and water activities every day, and enjoy it they do. From the crack of dawn polar bear swims, to daily pool games, to evening free swims on the hottest days of the summer, the pool is often voted as the most popular camp activity. In the early days of the camp, being in nature was one of the main activities, since there wasn't a lot of money for sports equipment and arts and crafts supplies. Hikes were part of every day. Counselors knew it helped tire the kids out too. As years went by, the camp added other programs and the walk in the woods needed something new to maintain the kids' interest. This observation tower was built to provide campers with a bird's eye view of Lake Ontario. This stage was constructed for children to perform scripted and impromptu plays. Many a camper and a few counselors discovered their acting abilities right on this stage. The, this challenge course provides healthy, risk-taking opportunities for campers and for a few older folks who prefer their feet firmly on the ground. All this activity works up quite an appetite, so it's off to the dining hall. Nobody's going to have any fun at camp without a good meal. Actually, that's three meals a day and a snack, all prepared by the camp's kitchen manager and her staff. Those who work long hours in a hot kitchen get loud cheers for their most popular meals, and there's at least one cookout picnic. While not as exciting as the activities, Camp Hollis meals play an important role for the campers, and not just because they're nutritious. Meals are served family style, with counselors acting as moms and dads 
who make sure their children are properly fed. For kids from an orphanage or from a broken home, this special attention means a lot. So does the fact that kids can always have seconds of whatever they want. Many children in the early years marveled at being able to have as much cold milk as they could drink. Campers got to try some new foods, but one camper in the 1950s was afraid to try Jello because it wiggled on her plate. A lot of meals have been served in this main building built in 1983. It replaced the original building constructed on its perch overlooking the lake in 1928. By 1953, camp administrators noticed something threatening that original main building. Erosion was cutting into the bluff a little every year, putting the building in danger of structural damage or possibly tumbling onto the shore. Oswego County decided that their best plan was to move the entire structure, a hefty project. To do so, they partnered with the United States Naval Seabees who provided equipment and manpower to divide the building into three sections and move them one at a time 500 yards to this location. That original building served the camp another 30 years. By 1983, it was 55 years old and considered a fire risk. Constructed almost entirely of wood, fire officials predicted the entire structure would be engulfed in flames in a matter of minutes. In order for the camp to operate, counselors were required to take a nighttime shift called fire watch, which meant two hours of walking around the outside perimeter of the building while shining a flashlight in search for signs of fire. It was, without a doubt, the worst part of being a camp counselor. Finally, funds were allocated to construct a new main building that complied with fire and safety codes. It featured a larger dining hall, a modern kitchen facility, and a nurse's office bigger than a closet. But best of all, counselors relieved of their fire watch duties could get a good night's sleep. Popular activities come and go at any camp, but one constant at Hollis has been its campfires. Some years it was a nightly event, but more recently there have been two campfires a session where campers enjoy counselors performing a variety of songs and skits Campfires play an important function at an overnight camp experience. Unlike a day camp, where children return to their home each day, overnight campers develop a sense of independence and self-confidence that comes from being away from their families. It's a big step for kids, and to help, counselors give their all during campfires. Counselors have always had their favorite songs sleep in front of a roaring fire. Every five years or so, a new collection of memorable tunes can be heard throughout the Camp Hollis neighborhood. Depending on the era, campers learn the words and hand motions to John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, Blown in the Wind, I've Got Sixpence, Boom Chicka Boom, Shoo Shoo Fly Pie, The Princess Pat, The Little Red Wagon, The Bear Song, If I Were Not at This Camp, or Baby Shark. Camp Hollis even has had a couple theme songs. There's Hollis Will Shine, which was credited to counselor Gene Galvin, who composed this optimistic lyric in 1953. And then there's this repeat after me chant composed by the 2006 staff called the Camp Hollis Spirit. I've got the Camp Hollis Spirit. I've got it all the time. I'm gonna pick it on up and pass it along to my good friend Alex, cause he's got it all the time. Thanks, Alexis. I got the Camp Hollis spirit. I got it all the time. I'm going to pick it on up and pass it along to the entire world. They got it all the time. Along with great songs, campers are also entertained by skits. Since counselors live together for the entire summer, they have lots of time to practice and make them uniquely theirs. Some skits have been around for a while, like Mr. Catch-It-All, where a counselor enters a doctor's office with a stomach ache and then proceeds to pick up every other illness in the waiting room. Or Purple Pancakes, in which a movie director keeps changing how the casts act out their painful deaths from eating poisoned pancakes. But only one skit can claim to have been part of Camp Hollis Evening Fire's 
since the camp was named Camp Hollis, the George Hollis Skit. Right? Dreamed up on the spot when those first counselors were taking campers on a long hike, the legend of George Hollis has morphed and changed many times over the years. The story's been told, acted, and there was a musical version. But the essence of the tale always remains the same. George Hollis was the best counselor who ever lived, and he proves his worthiness by rescuing a misbehaving camper who falls into a patch of quicksand. Yes, quicksand. Right. Though it's only a myth, counselors use this silly story to emphasize an important Camp Hollis rule. To prevent what happened to George, who disappeared in the quicksand, the story ends by counselors saying, never go in the woods alone. There's another tradition that deserves a special place in Camp Hollis's history, and that's the Hollis Hop, the last night of camp celebration complete with music, dancing, games, and refreshments. For decades, the Hop was a culmination of each camp session, and it included an awards ceremony for achievements like best camper and best archer. Counselors secretly planned each hop's theme, which were often based on the current hit record or a favorite musical group. The hop was held in the dining hall, and on the day of the event, campers weren't allowed near it as the room was decorated with whatever art supplies counselors could get their hands on. Anticipation built, and since for most campers it was their first social event, Counselors did everything to make them feel special. One counselor from the 1950s remembered that the girls would bring their best clothes. Some had pretty petticoats from home. We'd help them get dressed up and they would be so excited. We also took rags to do up the campers' hairs and curls. Anything to help them feel pretty for the dance. Things were a little different for the boy campers. A counselor from the 1970s remembered that we would bring a bottle of vintage aftershave to camp each week. I cleaned out my dad's medicine cabinet to bring bottles of Brut, English leather, and high karate. And then, in a rite of passage, the young boys would cup their hands and splash on the masculine colognes. Like Macaulay Culkin depicted in the box office hit Home Alone, there were a lot of peach fuzz cheeks stinging as they splashed on aqua velva or Old Spice for the first time. All that exciting preparation was worth it. Perhaps it gave campers the courage to ask someone they liked to dance. Many romances sparked at the Hollis Hop, and in a few cases, those summer flings lasted beyond the season. At the celebration for the camp's 50th anniversary, a married couple showed up holding hands. They wanted to walk the trails where they first held hands 50 years earlier. Today, when you walk the grounds at Camp Hollis, you'll notice a variety of gardens. Many were created by the special groups who've adopted the camp as their own. That's because along with traditional summer camp, Hollis is available for organizations and clubs have been able to reserve the camp for special occasions. The senior camping program, which brings the young at heart to Camp Hollis, created this heart-shaped garden to preserve their memories. Some of the other gardens you'll see at the camp are the Polowitz Garden, which is created by a family who comes to the camp once a year in a reunion to make their own memories. And then we have the Camp Rainbow of Hope Butterfly Garden, which brings children and adults together to attend a three-day camp sponsored by the Friends of Oswego County Hospice, where they can remember their loved one by creating and planting a tree or a small bush. Many of the gardens were upgraded this year by the Exelon Generation James A. Fitzpatrick Nuclear Power Plant. But it takes more than beautiful gardens to make Camp Hollis a special place. A camp can have the best food, the most interesting activities, and the funniest campfire skits, but none of that would be possible without the young adults who give up their summer to provide children a safe and happy experience. For many counselors, Camp Hollis is their first introduction to the working world. Many staff start out at 17 or 18, and admittedly, they have a lot to learn. One counselor put it that, I can see how it really helped me grow up. It was that 
interesting time of life when you're transitioning from a child to an adult. And we learned how to be parents by running the cabins, and I learned how to be a teacher from being an activity leader. All that hard work is worth it though, because working as a part of a team 24-7 creates strong bonds between staff members. It's amazing how many times we hear former counselors express the importance of working at Camp Hollis. One counselor who worked here in 1990 said this, the moment I set foot on Camp Hollis ground, I knew, without reservation, that I had found what I was looking for. I finally had a place where I felt like I truly belonged. I felt at home for the first time in my life, and even today, that hasn't changed. I've lived miles away from my camp friends for many years, so our contact is limited to the occasional birthday wish or comment on social media. What I know for sure, however, is that those friendships are cemented through our Camp Hollis experience, and the next time we are together, we will laugh, joke, and reconnect as if no time has passed. In its 75 years, Camp Hollis has benefited from over 2,000 counselors and camp leaders who gave their all for the children in need of a summer respite. Year after year, those children appreciated what they've been given, but many times their appreciation went unsaid. From time to time, however, camper stories become part of Camp Hollis's history. When I was compiling those stories for my book about Camp Hollis, it was the camper memories that stood out for me. Here are a few of those stories. William Dickerson, a camper in the 1950s who lived in one of the Oswego orphanages, credits Camp Hollis as one of the reasons he was able to move beyond his difficult childhood and achieve success in adulthood. One thing that saved me during my forlorn childhood was my ability to recognize the presence of hopeful beacons along the way, people who would treat me with kindness and respect. I used them to grow toward the light of my own positive future possibilities. Camp Hollis was one such beacon. Rusty Sorrell, a camper in the 1970s, knows it was the counselors who made his summers so special. There were counselors at Hollis who invoked in me a feeling that I was very, very special and for no other reason than because I exist. Sometimes in life we meet someone or go to a place or experience something that has life-changing impact in a most positive way. Those three things came together for me at Camp Hollis. I've always loved this story from legislator Hollis Island, who was a strong supporter of Camp Hollis during his years representing the town of Scruple and the Oswego County Legislature. Island shared this memory of one camper from his town who enjoyed her Camp Hollis stay so much she couldn't forget about it long after she returned home. This girl kept calling me, Island explained, begging for me to take her back to Camp Hollis, even though it was closed for the season. I finally caved in, and we when we arrived at the camp, the girl jumped out of my car and ran to the lake. I found her clutching a rock to her chest. She'd painted it while she was a camper that summer. This girl was homesick for camp. Those are the kinds of stories that have kept alive the dream created by Dr. Hollis and Judge Sullivan. Time has a way of changing things and programs for the betterment of children, and they reflect the attitudes and beliefs of those in charge. Exciting things are happening for Camp Hollis, and to tell us about some of them, let's meet the camp's current director. Hi, I'm Zach Grulitz, the coordinator of recreation and youth development for Oswego County. I spent many summers as a camper here at Hollis and began working on staff in 2007. After working for several years at various other camps, I was able to return to Camp Hollis in this position in 2019. We've got some exciting plans for camp as we begin our next 75 years of summer fun for kids. Here are a few things we're working on. Camp Hollis received a grant to winterize the main building. Currently, the camp season runs from May through November. This grant will allow for year-round programming and for lodging in the winter months for our rental groups. As a result, even more individuals will be served by Camp Hollis. Another upcoming project at Camp Hollis is upgrading Camp's playground. In 2021, the Friends of Camp Hollis launched a campaign to improve the playground, aiming to keep the playground an exciting place to visit. A third upcoming project at Camp Hollis is shoreline stabilization. As you can see behind me, Every year, we lose a couple of feet of land due to erosion. In fact, if the old main building were still standing, it would actually be in the lake. Oswego County received a grant from the Ready Commission to bring in large stone to block the wind and the waves to hopefully prevent any future land loss. 
Camp Hollis has had such a powerful impact on thousands of children over the past 75 years, and we are excited about what the next 75 years will bring. For more information about Camp Hollis programs, or to learn how you can make a difference in the life of a child today, visit us online or call the Oswego City County Youth Bureau. We hope to see you at camp very soon.